Um, I'm based in Qatar and I've been here for the last four years developing art therapy. Previously, I was in um, Hello, welcome to Wish Qatar 2020, the virtual summit. My name is Trish Bedford and uh, I'm the art therapist that will be presenting today about the fundamentals of art therapy. I've got a slideshow to come up and show you um, the outline of the session today. And what we're going to do is we're going to do some experiential um, so if you've got some art materials ready, that would be great because the best way to learn about art therapy is to have an experience of it. So I'm based here in Qatar. Um, I've been here for the last four years developing art therapy. Initially, I was developing art therapy in an addiction centre. Um, so I was working in groups and individuals. And um, from then, I've been doing some community groups, um, which has been going really well. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up some of the slides so that we can have some visuals. Um, if you've got any questions during this, please type them and um, I will check in every now and again. But if you don't have your question answered, I've got some time at the end for you. Um, so if you've got your art materials ready, I know that maybe you've been rushing in to get to this session today, so take your time. Have a slow breath and we'll have some time before we do the art session. So I'm just going to bring up the slides now. And so today's session, um, I just want us to start off with a little bit of deep breathing. And this is sometimes we use in art therapy sessions. We do a bit of mindfulness and we can use art therapy in that way too. It's a really nice way to combine the two. So the outline for today, we've got the introduction, which I'm doing now, um, a small experiential, just to give you a little insight. Um, we've got the fundamentals of art therapy, so I'll outline um, what we do uh, where you get your training and who can attend. And we'll have a brief, brief reflection at the end so that you can link some of your experiential with what we've talked about. So um, by the end of the workshop, you'll have an understanding to the following key concepts. What are the benefits of art therapy? Who can access art therapy? Where are art therapists work? How to become an art therapist? Why are art therapists trained to offer this intervention? And you'll have an experience of an art, art therapy activity. So it'll help you to understand the process during art therapy session as well. So this is a bit about me. As I said, I've been here for four years in Qatar, but previously before that I was in the UK, which is where I trained and um, where I worked for, um, I think it's about 13 years as an art therapist. So my experience is trauma-informed, which means that I um, really consider the different aspects that could be involved with trauma when I'm using my artwork. Um, I've worked in early intervention, especially autistic spectrum and behavior disorders, um, with addiction disorders and behaviors, um, refugees, asylum seekers, traffic persons, displaced persons. Um, I've been a clinical supervisor as well, an educator, workshop developer, facilitator, a visiting lecturer at the Art Therapy Masters programme in Hertfordshire University, where I studied, a psychosocial advisor for Qatar Red Crescent, and a past coordinator for different special interest groups that we continue our education with. Um, recently, we had a uh, mental health day panel discussion with CC The Works, where I invited other mental health professionals and members of the community to join and discuss art therapy in Qatar. Um, well, mental health in Qatar, but what came out of it was that actually um, a creative aspect was essential in building the bridge between <clears throat> stigma and art therapy um, and the mental health. So 
this is a just a brief overview of some of the work um, that I've done and my my journey to my profession. So I studied art and philosophy and art history and fine art. Um, I went on to do sales where I feel that I learned a lot about people because a lot is about your own experience. Um, and during my studies in art therapy, um, I did a, a graduate, before that I did a graduate placement in a socially deprived area. Um, so I learned a lot about the social aspects that are needed to think about when you're working with children and families. Um, my art therapy masters, I specialise in adult mental health, acute and enduring long-term mental health and an autism assessment unit. Um, as I previously mentioned, I worked for about nine years across um, autism, but it was with nine different schools and we had specific autism um, units with a, a team of dance movement therapists, drama therapists, psychotherapy, art, music and counselling. So the great thing about art therapy is that we can even use it with um, children who are nonverbal, um, so we can get early interventional relationship building. Um, so I've worked with, looked after children, um, social deprived schools, um, I've worked with refugees in camps or in assessment centres um, and I continued to do um, another master's in refugee care where I was the therapeutic caseworker. but I'll talk about a little bit more about that and this picture here is when I went to um, visit the Red Crescent psychosocial team in Gaziantep so art therapy is quite helpful with psychoeducation as well. So the fundamentals of art therapy, the main thing that I want to bring to you is about the experience. Um, and that's why I'm going to give a little bit of an experiential because John Dewey, who was a um, philosopher and who had quite an impact on education, uh, was stated to say, we don't learn from experiences, but we learn from reflecting on them. So reflection allows us to suspend, let go of how we get into habits of thinking and to understand our actions and feelings and behaviors. So through this experiential, um, you've got the concrete experience, you've got the reflective, the observational, um, the abstract conception and the active experimentation. So these are all parts and elements that are useful in most of the arts therapies. So today we're going to explore, um, but I'm inviting you to just do it through a, non, a place of non-judgment. Um, so we're gonna have some um, inviting you to think a little bit as we're talking and I hope it's enjoyable too. So expressive art therapies include art therapy, music therapy, dance movement therapy and drama therapy. They're the creative and expressive therapies that are available. So um, just coming back to you and I'm going to ask you to um, just get your art materials. I don't know what you've got. If you've got a um, pen, paper, art materials. So just try and shape, create a shape of the outline of a body. Now you can see I've got two different ones here. You can make one that looks very much like a body or you can make one that just has an abstract idea of a body to it. So what I want you to do is do that and I'll just explain some of the aspects that we use in um, the body scanning. So usually in mindfulness, um, we do the body scan by closing your eyes and just being aware of your body. Um, and so some people find this very difficult. Um, closing your eyes can feel very uncomfortable, especially if you've got a history of trauma, um, PTSD, but also sometimes you aren't able to regulate yourself enough to go into this um, process. So by using the art materials, we're slowly engaging the mind and the body and then doing the body scan using art materials. Okay, so if you've managed to do that, um, what I want you to do is to just take an intentional breath, just breathe in and breathe out. 
And as you're doing that, if you can slowly close your eyes or just start to look down, just so that you're starting to focus on yourself. And I want you to start noticing which parts of the body you're most aware of, which bits are you feeling are drawing your attention to. It might be pain, it might be discomfort, it might be um, that you're putting weight more on one side, that you've noticed that you're not sitting straight, if there's a funny tingling feeling, if there's um, anxiety, excitement, tension, anything that you're drawn to first. So just think about that space and think about what colour it might be. Does it have a texture? Does it have a sound or a movement kind of sensation? So when you feel comfortable enough, just open your eyes or look up and without thinking too much, just go for one of the art materials that just your eyes drawn to. And then I want you to just make a mark in that area. Any kind of mark, it doesn't have to be artistic. And then what we would do usually is we would just continue to do this, to repeat this four steps. And then slowly it sort of starts bringing you to notice things about um, what you've maybe ignored or maybe something's connected to something else. You're noticing feelings, you'll make, be able to maybe make sense of how you're feeling in the moment. And what you can do is you can create a key to the colour or the symbols in the corner. So the mind body connection in art therapy. So when you were doing that, I'd ask if you noticed a feeling or a sensation that you were not initially aware of. And were you surprised by anything? Because sometimes when I do this, people are actually quite surprised that they didn't notice something something was taking more of their attention and once they gave it their attention and maybe made something concrete about it, they were able to notice other parts of their body, other sensations. I say, was it linked to other sensations? Did it help you notice it? Did it affect your thinking or your presence in your body? And you can then write some words about how you're feeling. So you can connect the art to words and then that starts to create a narrative. So some people can use this at home. I've recently done um, some workshops and people have decided to do this between the sessions and they actually started to notice some themes. They didn't have any answers, but it, it just invited some curiosity. So um, a lot of people are doing journaling at the moment, so it's quite a useful way to have some journaling and then it's good to reflect on. So we're going to talk about art and therapy. So art and therapy is what we have art therapy. But sometimes this can cause some confusion and anxiety in people, um, maybe because it brings back memories of school or people don't really understand it. So it can actually um, either may, maybe make people anxious to use it, to, um, to attend it or even to refer people for it because it's not really understood that well. So art therapy, um, it allows us to access conscious and unconscious memories and experiences, because sometimes um, if I ask you a direct question about something, um, maybe your journey to work, you might give me some specific um, information. But if I asked you to draw your journey to work, we'd actually notice a little bit more. There'd be more to your story. Uh, we could pause on certain areas. So it just and then it could be linking to other memories that you had. So um, it also bypasses defensive thinking that can get expressed in verbal therapy. <laughs> memories and experiences. Because sometimes um, if I you. ask you a direct question Trish, about sorry. something, um, maybe you Yes? Yeah? It might they give me the some specific... Um, see the slides. Let me just come back. Thank you very much. Okay. Can you see this now? Can you see it now?
Thank you. Let me get us back to that bit. OK. Um, so I was just saying that the I'm not sure if you saw this slide, so sorry about that technical issue. So um, what it also does is it bypasses some of the defensive thinking. So instead of um, maybe saying that you didn't mean something or um, sort of shutting down and saying yes or no, it just opens things up a little bit more. So it's also a very full, concrete form of expression. So it's quite useful to return to. It's something that's there as you can look at another time. And it's very present in, in the therapy space. So the client also decides how much, if at all, they share about it. And that's very important that the client has some power, has choice and some ownership. So who can have art therapy? So art therapy is not limited to this um, list, um, but we've got adults, young adults, older age persons, children. So there we have the early intervention. We can see adolescents. Uh, we can also identify things early before the long term complex mental health issues that can set in in adolescence and um, in adulthood. Couples and families, mental health professionals. Um, a lot of doctors are getting support now um, to help with burnout. It's used a lot in the military and it's getting recognised quite a lot, especially in the USA. It's useful for non-verbal learning disabilities, autistic spectrum, Down syndrome, dyspraxia and so on. Refugees, asylum seekers, support groups for siblings or carers, new mothers, um, corporate and business, so we can use it to understand a little bit more about how businesses are functioning, if there's anything that um, needs addressing within a group dynamic within teams or just the system. Um, and it's for any ability, so we can adapt the art therapy sessions and the materials to what's needed by that specific person. And you don't need to be good at art, you don't have to have any experience, um, you just got to come along and be okay about trying out um, what's being offered. So why do people come for art therapy? Again, it's including but not limited to uh, maybe life stresses. So you're feeling overwhelmed, things are feeling a bit um, out of control and you want to understand a little bit more about what's going on and feel supported. Um, some people come, a majority do come with a diagnosis, but that, as I said, that's changing with the life stresses. People are realizing that they can seek help a lot earlier um, than waiting for diagnosis. So you can have anxiety, depression, um, self-harm, anorexia, um, anything in a diagnostic. Um, chronic illnesses, people with long-term chronic illnesses or um, people who are actually in hospital or hospices can access art therapy. Um, it can be used for social support for the elderly, refugees, human trafficking, um, trauma, domestic violence, school, children, attention, um, behaviours, um, also for very reserved. So we're not always looking for the ones that are acting out. Chris? Yes. Sorry to interrupt you one more time, please. Uh, can we try again with the slides because the audience cannot see the slides? OK, was, can they see me? No, yeah, I will with you until we see the slides and then I'll disappear. Sorry once again. No, 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 keep coming. But can you see the slide now? No. no. Can you see anything now? Not yet. Can you please disconnect your camera and put the slides on? Okay. on. Open share tray. Yeah. So. Does it keep disappearing? No, we can't see even your face. Really? You haven't had the slides at all? No, not at all. Can we switch your camera off and on again? Please? Is that it? Yeah, just a second. Now we can see the slide. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. OK. I'll stay with you. Here. Thank you. Please do. I do apologize. I didn't realize that the slides weren't being seen. So um, I will just get us back to 
where I was. So this was just the images for the body scan in case the slides were not up. So this was the body scan um, showing the different ways that you can outline the body. And I was just explaining about who can come to art therapy. So where do art therapists work? So we've got um, clinical models where we've got medical model, um, which is commonly used. So we're treating and focusing on the presenting problem. So a diagnosis and so forth. So you've got hospitals, physical and mental health, prisons, detention centres, addiction services, residential homes, supporting living homes, trauma centres, military, and it's an extensive list. Um, art therapy is becoming more and more accessible. Art therapy is becoming more recognised and needed. Um, we had a document by the WHO last year about the need for creativity and mental health. And actually in the UK, art therapy is also um, prescribed. All the arts and creativities are prescribed. So creativ creativity is essential in mental health. Um, so we've also got the non-clinical settings. So we've got community support, school lunch clubs and so on. So what is art therapy? Art therapy is a form of psychotherapy um, that uses art materials and creativity as the primary mode of communication. So it's both verbal and non-verbal. So our theoretical models are in attachment theory, object relations, groups analysis, group analytical psychotherapy. So images and creativity helps the patient to explore and to think about how they are feeling and their experiences and can give them a way to tell their story. Because sometimes words are not, are not enough. And as you know now, a lot of people are using emojis and memes. So they're trying to find, we're all trying to find different ways to express ourselves using images. So art can be a great way of um, containing as well as expressing. So sometimes our feelings get too much and can feel out of control or we don't feel that we're able to contain them. Um, so another thing about art therapy is the way that they can show them now, later, a different way that they can show them is, um, is they can show them whenever they feel like it. So mental health is the ability to experience a feeling without being overwhelmed with it. So that's the healthy part of um, mental health. But when you're not healthy, you might be ashamed of it. You might feel isolated. Um, you might feel that things are too much. So we're trying to get to that state where people feel OK. So image making in the right context can help learning or um, relearning because sometimes um, developmental stages have been passed by children. And so with art therapy, we can help them relearn some of those um, milestones that might have been missed. And also it opens up for emotional intelligence. So what art therapy is not is um, is basically when there isn't an art therapist, qualified trained art therapist present. So the other ones that people engage in, like doodling, coloring books, crafts, scrapbooks, um, and even if it's done in a group, because there isn't a qualified art therapist there, it's more therapeutic art. Um, and it, another thing that it gets um, mistaken for is an art class. So the art class, you're being taught specific skills, the strong direction, um, possibly grading and definitely uh, right or wrong outcomes. So images are really, really useful. Um, they're very uh, useful for narrative therapy. We can learn and explore our own stories using art. Um, they can hold ambivalence, so we don't always have to know what they mean. They can have um, contradictory meanings, so you can have um, things that don't make sense together, but they can make sense in your artwork. Um, there's lots of different ways that um, we can learn about identity, we can build on self-esteem, and trusting relationships are obviously um, very useful um, in helping the patients or the clients 
to develop um, a, a way of coping. So the difference between art therapy and talk therapy, um, as you can see on the left, you've got um, the art therapist, you've got the artist, which is the client, and you've got the picture. So they can look at um, the relationship kind of goes three ways. If you have just the, the person and the, um, the image without the therapist, then that's a different relationship. And then if you have the therapist um, and the client without the image, that's a different relationship again. Um, so having the picture and it takes away a lot of the, um, the feelings of um, sometimes um, a patient doesn't want to talk about things too much, so we can talk um, towards the art image instead. Um, so one of the, the importance about the relationship, I have an experience um, with the boy who did this image and um, I went to go to one of his um, meetings with the staff and the teachers and um, they were all discussing how he very much sits there and waits to be asked to do things. Um, I had some of the notes, um, but my experience was very different. My experience was that he couldn't wait to use the art materials. He didn't sit to wait um, and be told to do anything. So it just showed that we had a very different relationship and it helped us to understand a little bit more about what his needs were. Um, and that was... Um, that was to just allow him some space to not go in and tell him what he needs to do. So people used to think that he was waiting um, to be told what to do. And so then he learned to wait to be told what to do. So we kind of broke that cycle a little bit and that helped him to de develop more at home as well. So there's no wrong or right way to do art therapy because it's about your experience and your expression. And that's really important. Um, especially in, in, um, in different cultures, we just have to be aware that we are not, um, we're not the experts of somebody else's experience as a therapist. However, we're there to guide you. So that's why uh, an art therapist is trained uniquely. So psychological safety of the client and the patient is, is very important. So for this reason, um, especially in the UK, you need to be a registered art therapist. It's a protected title and there's a £5,000 fine for using the term art therapy if you're not qualified. We have lots of continuing professional development, clinical supervision. We need to be licensed and um, there's lots of recent research and articles on the damage that can be caused um, by those that aren't trained art therapists and um, it, it's one of the stories I, I know about is um, was to do with somebody who was um, not very well having a psychotic episode um, and so then they became quite unwell and actually physically hurt themselves so we need to do no harm. So what is the training? A lot of people want to know what the training is. It's getting more popular. Um, so usually the training is a second profession. It can either be a teacher, psychologist or counsellor, but actually it's also non-related. Um, so you don't have to have something to do with education or therapy, um, but it's ideal if you do have a creative background. Um, if you don't, then you'll be asked to do a foundation course um, and create a portfolio. So you have to have, be over a certain age because you do need life experience. Um, the Masters in Art Psychotherapy is art and psychology. So you need to be qualified in using art, as I mentioned, in a psychologically safe way. The Masters programmes are two years full time, three years part time. They consist of a placement, clinical placements each year, uh, research, supervision which is held within the university with your peers and the um, tutors and on placement as well and it's essential that we all have personal therapy whilst we're doing our training and ongoing if possible. So in short then um, art making and art therapy also helps us to 
make sense of our stories. Um, so we can know how to deal with them, how we feel about them. Um, so many psychological and emotional problems can be summed as invasions of the past into the present. And sometimes our brains don't know what to do with um, what to do with that. So um, So it helps us to think about and think for more flexibly by working in a language that doesn't fix meaning too soon. So it helps us to contain and reflect and um, reflect on experiences of ourselves and creatively towards other people. So these are some of the art materials um, that we can use in art therapy and what sort of feelings they can elicit. And here I'm going to just show you a quick video of um, all the different art materials they can use. And as you can notice, they go from um, dry materials and they're going to more wet, fluid material. For the reason that we sometimes set them out like this is because different art materials can possibly elicit different feelings in different people. Um, and so through our training, we know which ones would be useful to use, which ones might not be good for people to use because it can cause regression. So we have something called the Art Therapies Continuum and using the art materials, we can think about which ones are useful for each one of these different ones mentioned um, to help them bring them slowly into the inner balance of creativity in the middle. So, for example, if somebody's um, more controlled and likes to use pencils or pens, then we slowly try and build them into um, a more fluid, li liquid, um, messy materials, but we do it at the right balance. And then when we can get them into the to the middle of inner, inner balance and creativity, then that's where they're healthy. So we need to make sure that we're creating a safe container for therapeutic work. Um, and by that, that we're developing the work collaboratively with our patients and clients. So we're gaining insight into the clients at the client's pace. We're not pushing them. We explore things at their pace and when they feel ready or when we think they're ready, then we might develop more in um, gaining more insight. So we're identifying and defining the initial needs that they come to art therapy with. And then we might be finding out new themes that are emerging um, that might be wanting to work through or to adapt. Um, and we can create assessments and direct towards further interventions if needed. So we can refer out. Um, we're very competent in culture and difference, and that's very important because it's quite a Western model. So when we're taking it to other cultures, other countries, we really have to um, reflect on these aspects of our interventions and our work. So we're planning for special conditions. So if in the future, or currently there's anything that we have concerns about, then we um, incorporate um, that into the sessions and we're identifying a treatment plan together. So a lot of people think that art therapists um, have like a little black book where we can say this has been drawn and this is what this means. And we have some idea of what um, maybe some symbols and metaphors could um, point towards, um, but we just have to be very careful about interpretation um, because we could be getting something wrong and we have to give the ownership to the patient and the client. So just to give you an idea of a structure of a session, um, you've got the confidentiality, which is really important for providing trust. If we are going to talk about anything outside of the session and supervision, 
um, then we have already informed the patient or the client and we don't share images unless um, we have permission to do so or talk about them outside. Um, the space where we have art therapy, it can be in um, a specific art therapy space. I've worked in sheds, I've worked in gardens, uh, school classrooms, offices, um, out on the streets. So, you know, but the space is actually the mental boundary as well. Um, the time is a, a non-physical boundary as well. So we try and have a predictable time each week. So with some consistency, usually about 50 minutes. Um, groups would be for 90 minutes minimum. Recently, I've been doing groups for three hours. And the feedback was generally that they wanted more time. Um, the therapeutic relationship as we've spoken about before, and boundaries. So we don't have rules so much. I've got this picture here that some children drew uh, when I asked them what did they wanted to add to the rules. So we've got listening, have fun, rock, paper, scissors, and exit. So they've kind of got it in there a little bit, you know, the, play, the playfulness, some of the rules there, and having to go. Um, so what I wanted to do, I'm not sure if you, any of you managed to do any of the artwork before um, when you joined. So just if you didn't, just think about any of the artwork you've done recently or um, anything that comes to mind. And I just want you to reflect on your own art making and think about how it, how did it feel during the process of the art making? What was the experience like for you? If you were by yourself or you with other people, um, was there anything that felt uncomfortable for you? And how did you respond? So I'm just going to come out of the share just to see if there's any questions really quickly. Um, I've just seen that we can extend for another 15 minutes, which is brilliant because I was um, worried about not being able to cover everything and get the um, questions in. So um, if you do have any questions, we'll be coming up to that in a second. So I'll just go back to the screen. So what we wanted to think about was when you're having art therapy session, it's not just the drawing. There's a lot going on and the art therapist is also looking and taking in a lot of information. So we're aware of the physical, the psychological, the emotional, the social and the personal. Um, I wanted to just go back to one of these images up here. So this this image was of a boy with autism. He was um, um, about 14 and he used to come in and just create lots and lots and lots of um, images of cartoons. He would remember cartoons word for word image and, and, and he had a, a visual memory and he would just talk about his cartoons and and draw them and then slowly I was able to move him onto the painting um, but what we had to do is we had to find a fine line between him spending time because I didn't want to stop his creativity with his um, cartoons so we had an agreement where he would spend some time on the cartoons and the rest of the session doing um, any creative art so in that we moved him from you know doing something quite safe for him and then he was able to have an experience that was quite different um, and he would I think you can see another painting on the floor he would just make so much more so much more um, and when I was with him he used to sit with his leg on the chair one leg up one leg down it looked really uncomfortable and um, he would bend over and so sometimes I would I would mirror him. I would do the same as him. Um, and he was he wouldn't really notice me. But when I was doing the same as him, 
he then started to notice me in the room. So there's something about being mirrored, about being seen. Um, sometimes when patients, uh, clients come to art therapy, um, they don't want to, um, they don't want to, I'm just going to stop sharing so that I can come back. I don't know if you can see me. Um, I'm going to put my camera on. Okay, so um, as I was saying, sometimes uh, patients come and they don't really want to do any art. Um, they don't want to talk and that's fine. I've had patients, I've had school children come in and just go and sleep in the corner. And depending on how I feel and how our relationship is, I might create a drawing of them. Um, again, I'd, I'd really consider it. And, and the response usually has been quite good um, because they feel seen. They feel that they didn't come in and were ignored. Um, so there's different ways that we can approach art therapy. It's not always just drawing in the moment. Um, there's something about collaboration, about them being seen. Um, so I've got a question here. What, what age can children start benefiting from art therapy and how young? So I think the youngest I've worked with has been um, maybe about four or five. Um, but I believe there's a lot of assessment centres, um, especially for autism and developmental, um, where they start a lot younger. I, I can't say for exactly how young, um, but I'd say maybe about three. Um, I have a colleague that went to one of those, a music therapist, and he was starting pretty young. So I hope that answers a little bit of the question. If not, feel free to ask again. Um, so I wanted to just give some, maybe some um, anecdotal um, stories while waiting for more questions. Um, so I had one, um, one patient recently and he was coming into the detox unit and he um, had feeling, lots of feeling of anger and rage and, and a lot of sadness behind it. Um, and there was two of them that came in and, and did the body scan actually that I've asked you to do at the beginning. And um, through that, they didn't want to talk, but through that they were able to put different parts of, of their feelings in the body. And from that, instead of asking, how are you? Or asking what's wrong? Or, you know, even why did you relapse or anything like that? Um, I was able to just refer to the image um, and just ask, you know, ask about the feeling, ask where it's sitting, how long has it been there? So that's what I mean about the third person. We can just start inviting the image into the conversation. Um, and then that feels a lot safer for the patients. Um, he was able to actually say how angry he had been and that actually talking therapy wasn't useful for him. Um, but we were able to find ways that we could incorporate art therapy into the whole program. Um, so this was someone who didn't feel able to say why he was angry and what was wrong. And just through that session of just slowly gradually thinking about feelings in the body and then gently asking questions and opening it up, we learned um, a lot more than we might have done if we sat face to face and just asked questions. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, a lot of the research that's coming in at the moment. Um, I'm going to share this slide again. So there's lots of research and collaborative work that's coming up with art therapy. Um, let me see, where has it gone? What's the slide now? <laughs> um, and from that, we're learning a lot more about the body and mind connection, which is becoming quite a, a popular thing here. So, um, I want to go up to here and talk about that, sorry. So there's lots of research being done now um, with neurobiology about trauma, about um, the somatic um, aspects of 
therapy. So, um, so there's a lot more research going on. There's lots more new interventions and collaborations, as I said. Um, a lot of the recent art therapy conferences have had um, art therapists and neurobiologists or art therapists that are working in the in that field as well. So there's lots of collaboration. Um, I just wanted to give you some of the experience I've had here. Um, museums and gallery visits with art therapy is expanding as well globally. And I myself took some patients to um, the fire station gallery a couple of years ago and I took patients that were in the daycare treatment and in the um, the rehabilitation detox they were staying um, overnight so both um, patients went on different days and actually the experience was important for two reasons because it helped to actually um, address stigma so the people that were at the museum and gallery were able to have an experience of people with addictions and um, were actually quite surprised that they weren't presenting as they thought they would. And the patients that came with me um, didn't know about the gallery. They didn't know about what it offered. Um, they were really interested in all the artworks. They got inspired um, by different ways to look at artwork. And then this also um, informed the art therapy sessions. So everyone's experience of art therapy, of art before coming to therapy um, is relevant. Um, but what I've experienced is that when people um, break down those barriers a little bit by just allowing themselves to come and just experience and not judge themselves, um, then something can be broken through to them. And um, people have shared with me that they didn't like art therapy at the beginning, maybe, and that actually it became a really, really important part of their lives and they found something new. So the neural pathways that we have, that forming habits, um, can art, art can help to build new neural pathways. Um, and so that's why it's important to just keep um, trying to use art therapy as much as we can in, um, in mental health sectors and communities um, and just to keep the research. So there's some research going on in Qatar at the moment. Um, in Qatar, there's uh, two art therapists currently and an arts, an expressive arts therapist. So there's not many of us here. Um, and I think the need is great, as we, as I explained in the mental health um, panel discussion. So I quite like this quote because it says, tread softly because you tread on my dreams. So when we look at people's artwork, we just have to really, really be um, quite sensitive. And so I very much stay away from questions like, why did you do that? Why have you done that? and just honor that they've done something that they might even not know why they did it. And just be curious, just continue to be curious with them. I wanted to share this because I think it, it helps to understand why art therapy can be so useful. So these are 23 emotions that people feel but can't explain. Um, so I'm just gonna go back and see if there's any questions and come back on here. So I've got another question and the question is, how can art therapy help children with special needs um, recognize and respond to facial expressions and social cues? Um, well, the important thing to remember is that how children learn about the world is through play. Play, creativity, um, some form of repetitiveness sometimes um, and also from um, we we do a lot about attachment in art therapy so it's about the mother's gaze that's the the the, the eye contact and, and the repeating things um, when you're looking at the baby so to help recognize and respond to facial expressions and social cues I'd say it's something that would take time um, it would 
very much from my experience depend on the relationship that's built with the art therapist. Um, I've worked, as I said, with um, lots and lots and lots of uh, pupils on the autistic spectrum. And sometimes it's about slowing down what's going on in their process. So, um, or acknowledging and sitting and acknowledging what they're doing and naming it. Um, because very much they're in their own little world. So we need to find a way to get into that world and understand what's going on. Um, and I think that there's something really interesting that um, someone from a, an autistic person shared with me at um, a talk, which was, if you think about, if you want to think about what it's like for someone with autism, some special needs, not being able to write, recognize facial expressions and social cues, you have someone that puts a paper bag on their head and then you try and understand a little bit more about, you know, that experience because that's what it's like for them. They don't really recognize it. So it's through, I think, the relationship, maybe side by side working, as I said, um, I think one of one of the, the I think there's two or three that I could talk about, but um, one of the longest um, therapy sessions I have, uh, interventions I've done is about five years. And um, initially the boy would come in and he wouldn't give me any eye contact. He would just come and start putting tape on the room or hiding under the table. Um, so I would allow him to do as much as he wanted to do and gently bring in art therapy interventions. Sometimes it would just be helping him put, um, put things up together. So there's something about then being aware of the other person and being allowed into his space. Um, and if he would have a meltdown, if there was glitter and it went everywhere and he went onto the floor and just lay there and just collapsed, um, I would then also just lie next to him on the floor and just name things. So sometimes it's about helping them to understand by naming things. Um, and then we would use the art to do that as well. So we'd use the art to maybe draw what happened in the session. Um, so for me, it, was, it would be very much the um, relationship with the art therapist, um, getting to understand how that, um, that child or that person um, relates to the world. And then we can start relating to them using art therapy interventions. It's very difficult to say um, a one size fits all for that. Um, so how effective is art therapy for cancer patients? That's a nice question. Um, so the other art therapist in Qatar actually works in um, a hospital with patients who have a cancer diagnosis. And I think one of the things that can be really difficult is, is facing that uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty with diagnosis like cancer, um, feeling alienated, um, feeling scared about decisions you've made or decisions you have to make. Um, so, and it depends where they are in their journey and the support they have already. But art therapy can offer a space for them to just explore that, to find out about where they are now, maybe draw on some strengths. You know, there's lots of interventions we can use to think about what someone's strengths are, what they need, how can they ask for it, um, how far they've come, what they want their treatment to look like, what they want the support to look like. So there's lots of ways that we can build an intervention. And, and doing art therapy in groups, if they're able to attend a group, um, just stops that isolation. You know, they feel a bit connected. They feel um, that they're not alone. So I hope that helps a bit. I think it depends where the cancer patient is as well. Um, but there's lots of ways that it, it can help. And, and from what I haven't worked with cancer patients myself, but from what I've heard, it just gives some sort of ownership because there's something about um, not having control. And what our therapy can do is give you some control back. 
Um, and very much what happens is you have a lot of choice. You choose the art materials, you can choose where you sit, you can choose the paper, you can choose to engage, you can choose not to engage, you know, you can choose to share, not to share. There's so much about choice that a lot of people that maybe need art therapy um, rather than want it um, might be lacking in choice and control and ownership. Um, and yeah, so it can help them to maybe just reconnect with themselves and think about their narrative. I hope that's helpful. If not, ask again. So I'm just going to wait for a few more questions. I do apologize at the beginning um, for the slides not coming through, but I hope you were able to catch up. Um, so if you've got your art materials still now, there's something you can do that doesn't have to, you know, you don't have to do it now, but it could be something that you um, can do after today or just hold on to. So one of the, the um, useful art therapy intervention prompts um, is about the journey. You know, a lot, a lot of what we are trying to explore is our journey. So what you could do is you could have a question for yourself, which is about what's your journey to here today? And that can be very abstract or it can be quite direct, but I'd invite you to do that. Just start thinking about your journey and create a path, a road, you know, how you would go on your journey and through that you'll start developing a narrative and it might be something that you want to add um, if you've got goals or if you want to do anything else okay so we've got um we've got about three minutes left um maybe if we can extend it um about five minutes or 10 minutes max because i just wanted to share some um just going to share the contact details. If anyone else has got any more questions, do let me know. Um, I'll just pop up my... Okay. Okay, I'm not sure if anyone's. So I wanted to talk about also about um, back to the mind body and about self-regulation. So one of the ways that art therapy is useful is that it's a ground up approach. And so it helps to regulate. So sometimes maybe when, um, for example, children aren't able to recognize or respond to facial expressions or social cues, there's a lot more going on inside them. So they're not able to, to think about what's going on outside because there's a lot more going on inside. So if you find a way to, um, to regulate, which is what usually happens with the mother and child, the, the um, the mother helps to regulate the child. So if something's happened developmentally or due to trauma, um, then this can be um, disrupted. So art therapy, we can um, regulate quite simply by just getting two art materials and using both hands. So by doing that and making movements, we're just balancing up the left and the right side and we're regulating. So we're able to, um, to help people be more present um, and this has been a quite useful um, aspect that I've used um, with patients with high, high anxiety. Um, we can use lots of um, natural found objects. So if we do art therapy outside and we can find things that we can use for both hands as well. So I'm just going to, we've got a couple more minutes if there's any more questions. Um, I don't mind what kind of questions. They don't have to be specifically about um, training, there can be anything.
I'm just going to put this. I'm just going to share my um, contact details quickly. So I'm aware that we might finish soon. So this is my contact details. Um, oh, it's disappeared again. So art therapists and technology don't always go together. <laughs> um, I'd say that most of the time I, uh, I get some sort of technology issues. So these are my contact details. Um, please do stay in touch if anybody has any further questions, if something wasn't covered, um, if you're more curious about anything. So um, my contact email is therapeuticart at hotmail.com and Instagram is therapeuticartqatar and the Facebook is therapeuticart and Twitter is therapeuticart1. So I'm just going to come back and see. Okay, let me put my camera back on. So if there's no more questions, I think, um, I mean, I could go on and tell you lots more stories. I think I've got one more left and then I will, um, I will leave you for your evening. So um, I had one session with a young girl who, um, who was on the autistic spectrum. She was about 10. And initially she was, um, she wasn't nonverbal, but she would be quite animalistic with her expressions towards me. Um, and it was very difficult to, to actually form a relationship with her. It took a long time, um, but I would just, just be patient. I would go and speak to her. Sometimes she'd try and scratch or, or hit out. Um, and so just gently and slowly and slowly we would, come in and um, that picture with the bucket of paint um, was actually the beginning of our art therapy sessions um, and we just fill it. Um, so there's something about being contained, you know, we were pouring the water in and out, we were putting the containers into the water. So we were trying to, she was trying to explore something about containment. Um, and then uh, she went up to senior school and we continued to have art therapy, but we'd be in the shed. So I would always give her the key. Um, I like to give some responsibility. So, um, but sometimes she wouldn't want to come. So I would stand outside. I wouldn't not go to the therapy session. I would stand outside and just wait for her. Um, but after about two years, so in total, I think it was three years we were seeing each other. Um, she actually became more vocal. She was she was more involved in storytelling. She would um, bring pictures in to talk to me about. And um, so eventually she became more vocal and you're asking about how to, because this girl wouldn't respond to facial expressions, um, a little bit on social cues, but by the end of it, um, our therapeutic relationship, um, she would come to the therapy sessions on time. She would leave on time. Uh, we'd lock up the whole shed together. And so through that gentle um, exploration with her about containment, um, we were able to, to form a relationship and she was able to continue on to further education as well. Um, okay, so I think we're at the end of this presentation. Thank you for your patience through the technology issues. Um, I hope that it answers some of your questions about art therapy and about the uses and the training. If you have any more questions, as I said, please do get in touch and have a lovely evening. And I hope you enjoy the rest of WISH Virtual 2020. Thank you very much.